Chapter 6, The Spirit's Comforting. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Matthew 11, 28. Several Sequential Steps. The saving work of the Spirit in the heart of God's elect is a gradual and progressive one, conducting the soul step by step in the dual method and order of the gospel to Christ. Where there is no self-condemnation and humiliation, there can be no saving faith in the Lord Jesus. Ye repented not afterwards, that ye might believe him. Matthew 21, 32 was his own expressed affirmation. It is a burdensome sense of sin which prepares the soul for the Savior. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden. Matthew 11:28. Without conviction there can be no contrition and no compunctiation. He that sees not his wickedness and guilt never mourns for it. He that feels not his filthiness and wretchedness never bewails it. Never was there one tear of true repentance seen to drop from the eye of an unconvicted sinner. Equally true is it that without the illumination there can be no conviction. For what is conviction but the application to the heart and conscience of the light which the Spirit has communicated to the mind and understanding? Acts 2.37 So likewise, there can be no effectual illumination until there has been a divine quickening. For a dead soul can neither see nor feel in a spiritual manner. In this order, then, the Spirit draws souls to Christ. 1. He brings them from death unto life. Quickening. 2. Shines into their minds. Enlightening. 3. Applies the light to their consciousness by effectual conviction. Convicting. 4. Wounds and breaks in their heart for sin and compunctuation. Repentance. And then 5. Moves the will to embrace Christ in the way of faith for their salvation. Faith. These several steps are more distinctly discerned in some Christians than in others. They are more clearly to be traced in the adult convert than in those who are brought to Christ in their youth. So, too, they are more easily perceived in such as are drawn to him out of a state of profaneness than those who had the advantage of a pious education. Yet in them, too, after conversion, the exercise of their hearts, following a period of deconciliation and backsliding, correspond thereunto. But in this order the work of the Spirit is carried on ordinarily in all. However, it may differ in points of clearness in the one and in the other. God is a God of order both of nature and in grace, though we be tied down to no hard and fast rules. Weaned from the world, by his mighty work of illumination and conviction, with the humiliation which is wrought in the soul, The Spirit effectually weans the heart forever from the comfort, pleasure, satisfaction, or joy that is to be found in sin, or in any creature, so that his soul can never be quiet and content, happy or satisfied, till it finds the comfort of God in Christ. Once the soul is made to feel that sin is the greatest of all evils, it sours for him the things of the world. He has lost his deep relish for them forever, and nothing is now so desirable unto him as the favor of God. All creature comforts have been everlastingly marred and spoiled, and unless he finds comfort in the Lord, there is none for him anywhere. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably unto her. Hosea 2.14 When God wins his church's heart to him, what does he do? He brings her into the wilderness, that is, into a place which is barren or devoid of all comforts and delights, and then there he speaks comfort to her. Thus, too, he deals with the individual. A man who has been effectively convicted by the Spirit is like a man condemned to die. What pleasure would be derived from the beautiful flowers as a murderer was led through a lovely garden to the place of execution?
Nor can any spirit-convicted sinner find contempt in anything till he is assured of the favor of him who he has so grievously offended. And none but God can speak comfortably to the one so stricken. The nature of the Spirit's comforting. Hosea 2, verse 6. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, and will make a wall that she shall not find her pass. Hosea 2, verse 7 and 9. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore I will return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and will recover my wool and my flax, given to cover her nakedness. Hosea 2, 10-13 And now I will discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall be delivered out of my hand. And I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she has said, These are the rewards that my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels. And she went after her lovers, and forgot me, saith the Lord. Chapter 2, 14 and 15. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably unto her, and I will give her vineyards from hence, and the valley of Achor, for a door of hope, and she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Quote, and I will give her vineyards from hence, in the valley of Achor, for a door of hope. Unquote. Hosea chapter 2, verse 15. Such is the comforting promise of God to the one whom he purposes to allure or win to himself. First he hedges up the sinner's way with thorns, Hosea 2.6, piercing his conscience with sharp arrows of conviction. Second, he effectively battles all his attempts to drown his sorrows and find satisfaction again in his former lovers. Verse 7. Third, he discovers his spiritual nakedness and makes all his mirth to cease. Verse 10 and 11. Fourth, he brings him unto the wilderness, verse 14, making him feel his case is desperate indeed. And then fifth, when all hope is gone, when the poor sinner feels there is no salvation for him, a door of hope is open for him, even in the valley of Achor, or, quote, trouble, unquote. And what is that door of hope but the mercy of God? It is by putting into his mind thoughts of God's mercy that the Spirit supports the fainting heart of the convicted sinner from sinking beneath abject despair. Now it is that the blessed Spirit helps his infirmities with groanings that cannot be uttered. And in the midst of a thousand fears, he is moved to cry, God be merciful to me, a sinner. No place for a decision to be saved. One would naturally suppose that the good news of a free Savior and a full salvation would readily be embraced by a convicted sinner. One would think that, as soon as he heard the glad tidings, he could not forbear exclaiming, in a transport of joy, This is the Savior I want. His salvation is every way suited to my wretchedness. 
What can I desire more? Here I will rest. But as a matter of fact, this is not always the case. Yea, it is rarely so. Instead, the stricken sinner, like the Hebrews in Egypt after Moses had been made manifest before them, is left to groan under the lash of his merciless taskmasters. Yet this arises from no defect in God's gracious provision, nor because of any inadequacy in the salvation which the gospel presents, nor because of any distress in the sinner which the gospel is incapable of relieving. But because the workings of self-righteousness hinder the sinner from seeing the fullness and glory of divine grace. Strange as it may sound to those who have but a superficial and not experiential acquaintance with God's truth, awakened souls are exceedingly backwards from receiving comfort in the glorious gospel of Christ. They think that they are utterly unworthy and unfit to come to Christ just as they are in all their vileness and filthiness. They imagine some meekness must be wrought in them before they are qualified to believe the gospel, that there must be a certain holy disposition in their hearts before they are entitled to conclude that Christ will receive them. They fear that they are not sufficiently humbled under a sense of sin, that they have not a suitable abhorrence of it, that their repentance is not deep enough, that they must have fervent breathings after Christ and pantings after holiness before they can be warranted to seek salvation with a well-grounded hope of success. All of which is the same thing as hugging the miseries of unbelief in order to obtain permission to believe. Burdened with guilt and filled with terrifying apprehensions of eternal destruction, the convicted sinner, yet experimentally ignorant of the perfect righteousness which the gospel reveals for the justification of the ungodly, strives to obtain acceptance with God by his own labors, tears, and prayers. But as he becomes better acquainted with the high demands of the law, the holiness of God, and the corruptions of his own heart, he reaches a point where he utterly despairs of being justified by his own strivings. What must I do to be saved? Is now his agonizing cry. Diligently searching God's word for light and help, he discovers that faith is the all-important thing needed, but exactly what faith is and how it is to be obtained, he is completely at a loss to ascertain. Well-meaning people with more zeal than knowledge urge him to, quote, believe, unquote, which is the one thing above all others he desires to do. But he finds himself utterly unable to perform. If saving faith were nothing more than a mere mental assertion to the contents of John 3.16, then any man could make himself a true believer whenever he pleased. The supernatural enablement of the Holy Spirit would be quite unnecessary. But saving faith is very much more than a mental assertion to the contents of any verse of Scripture. And when a soul has been divinely quickened and awakened to its awful state by nature, it is made to realize that no creature act of faith, no resting on the bare letter of a text by a, quote, decision, unquote, of his own will, can bring pardon and peace. He is now made to realize that faith is a divine gift, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and not a creature work, that it is wrought by the operation of God, Colossians 2, verse 12, and not by the sinner himself. He is now made conscious of the fact that if he ever is to be saved, the same God who invited him to believe Isaiah 45:22, yea, who commands him to believe, 1 John 3:23, must also impart faith to him, Ephesians 6:23. Cannot you see, dear reader, that if a saving belief in Christ were the easy matter which the vast majority of preachers and evangelists of today say it is, 
that the work of the Spirit would be quite unnecessary? Ah, is there any wonder that the mighty power of the Spirit of God is now so rarely witnessed in Christendom? He has been grieved, insulted, quenched, not only by the skepticism and worldliness of, quote, modernness, unquote, but equally so by the creature-exalting free willism and self-ability of man to, quote, receive Christ as his personal Savior, unquote, of the, quote, fundamentalists. Oh, how very few today really believe those clear and emphatic words of Christ, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me by his Spirit, draw him. John 6, 44. Ah, my reader, when God truly takes a soul in hand, he brings him to the end of himself. He not only convicts him of the worldliness of his works, but he convinces him of the own impotence of his will. He not only strips him of the filthy rags of his own self-righteousness, but he empties him of all self-sufficiency. He not only enables him to perceive that there is no good thing in him, Romans 7.18, but he also makes him feel he is without strength, Romans 5.6. Instead of concluding that he is man whom God will save, he now fears that he is a man who must be lost forever. He is now brought down into the very dust and made to feel that he is no more able to savingly believe in Christ than he can climb to heaven. We are well aware that what has been said above differs radically from the current preaching of this decadent age, but we will appeal to the experience of the Christian reader. Suppose you had just suffered a heavy financial reversal and were at your wit's end knowing how to make ends meet. Bills are owed, your bank has closed, you look in vain for employment and are filled with fears over future prospects. A preacher calls and rebukes your unbelief, bidding you to lay hold of the promises of God, that the very thing which you desire to do, but can you by an act of your own will. Or a loved one is suddenly snatched from you, your heart is crushed, grief overwhelms you. A friend kindly bids you to, sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. Are you able to, by a personal decision, to throw off your anguish and rejoice in the Lord? Ah, my reader, if a mature Christian can only cast all his cares upon the Lord by the Holy Spirit's gracious enablement, do you suppose that a poor sinner who is yet in the galls of bitterness and bonds of iniquity can lay hold of Christ by a mere act of his own will? Just as to trust in the Lord with all his heart, Proverbs 3, 6, to be anxious for nothing, Philippians 4, 6, to let the morrow take care of its own concern, Matthew 6, 34, is the desire of every Christian. But how to perform that which is good? He, quote, finds not, unquote, Romans 7:18 until the Holy Spirit is pleased to graciously grant the needed enablement. The one supreme yearning of the awakened and convicted sinner is to lay hold of Christ. But until the Spirit draws him to Christ, he finds he has no power to go out of himself, no ability to embrace what has profited him in the gospel. The fact is, my reader, that the heart of a sinner is as naturally indisposed for loving and appropriating the things of God as the wood which Elijah laid upon the altar was to ignite when he had poured so much water upon it, as not only to saturate the wood, but also to fill the trench round about. 1 Kings 18.33 a miracle is required for the one is as much as it was for the other. The fact is that if souls were left to themselves, to their own free will, after they had been truly convicted of sin, none would ever savingly come to Christ. A further and distinct operation of the Spirit is still needed to actually draw the heart closer with Christ himself. Were the sinner left to himself, he would sink in abject despair. He would fall victim to the malice of Satan. The devil is far more powerful than we are, and never is his rage more stirred 
than when he fears he is about to lose one of his captives. See Mark 9.20. But blessed be the name, the spirit does not deserve the soul when his work is only half done. He who is the spirit of life, Romans 8.2, to quicken the dead. He who is the spirit of truth, John 16.13, to instruct the ignorant is also the spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13, to enable us to savingly believe. How the Spirit Comforts And how does the Spirit work faith in the convicted sinner's heart? By effectively testing him of the sufficiency of Christ for his every need. By assuring him of the Savior's readiness to receive the vilest who has come to him. He effectually teaches him that no good qualification need be sought, no righteous acts performed, no penance endured in order to fit us for Christ. He reveals to the soul conviction of sin and deep repenting. A sense of our other helplessness are not grounds of acceptance with Christ, but simply a consciousness of our spiritual wretchedness rendering relief in a way of grace truly welcome. Repentance is needful not as inducing Christ to give, but as disposing us to receive. The Spirit moves us to come to Christ in the very character in which alone he receives sinners, as vile, ruined, and lost. Thus, from start to finish, salvation is of the Lord. John 2.9 of the Father in obtaining it, of the Son in purchasing it, of the Spirit in applying it. Chapter 7 The Spirit Draweth No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. John 6:44. As a Christian now loves God, quote, because he first loved Unquote him, First John 4.19. So he sought Christ, because Christ first sought him. Luke 19.10. Before Christ seeks us, we are well content to lie fast asleep in the devil's arms, and therefore does the Lord say, I have found of them that sought me not. Isaiah 65.1. When the Spirit first applies the word of conviction, he finds the souls of all men as the angels found the world in Zechariah 1.11, quote, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest, unquote. What a strange silence and midnight stillness there is among the unsaved. There is none that seeketh after God, Romans 3.11. It is because of failure to perceive the dreadful condition in which the natural man lies that a difficulty is experienced in seeing the imperative need for the Spirit's drawing power if he is to be brought out of it. The natural man is so completely enslaved by sin and enchanted by Satan that he is unable to take the first step towards Christ. He is so bent on having his own way and so adverse to pleasing God he is so in love with the things of the world and so out of love with the holiness that nothing short of omnipotence can produce a radical change of art in him, so that he will come to hate the things that he naturally loved and love what he previously hated. The Spirit's drawing is the freeing of the mind, the affections, and the will from the reigning power of depravity. It is his emancipation of the soul from the dominion of sin and Satan. Prior to that deliverance when the requirements of God are pressed upon the sinner, he in every case rejects them. It is not that he is adverse from being saved from hell, for none desire to go there, but he is unwilling to forsake, Proverbs 28.13, Isaiah 55.7, his idols, the things which hold the first place in his affections and interests. This is clearly brought out in our Lord's parable of the Great Supper. When the call went forth, 
come for all things are now ready, we are told, quote, they all with one consent begin to make excuse, unquote. Luke 14, 18. The meaning of that term excuse is explained in what immediately follows. They preferred other things. They were unwilling to deny themselves. They would not relinquish the competitive objects, the things of time and sense, a piece of ground, oxen, or a wife, were their all-absorbing concerns. Had nothing more been done by the servant, in this parable the Holy Spirit, all had continued to make excuse until the end. That is, all had gone on cherishing their idols and turning a deaf ear to the holy claims of God. But the servant was commissioned to bring hither, verse 21, yea, to compel in them to come in, verse 23. It is a holy compulsion, not by physical force, which is there in view, the melting of the hard heart, the woeing and winning of the soul to Christ, the bestowing of faith, the impartation of a new nature, so that the hitherto despised one is now desired and sought after. Quote, I drew them with cords of a man, parentheses, using means and motives suited to rational nature, and parentheses, with bonds of love, end quote. Hosea 11.4. And again, God says of his people, with loving kindness have I drawn thee, Jeremiah 31.10. The divine drawer is unto God's people, quote, the spirit of grace and of supplications, unquote, Zechariah 12.10. Of grace in making to their smitten consciousness and exercised hearts a wondrous discovery of the rich grace of God unto penitent rebels. Of supplication in moving them to an act as a man fleeing for his life to seek after divine mercy. Then it is he who leads the trembling soul to Calvary before whose eyes Jesus Christ is now evidently plainly set forth crucified. Galatians 3.1 Beholding the Savior by faith, bleeding for and making atonements for his sin more vitally and heart affectingly than all the angels in heaven could impart. And hence it follows in Zechariah 12.10 They should look upon me whom they have pierced then it is that their eyes are open to see that which was hitherto hidden from them, namely, quote, the fountain opened for sin and for uncleanliness. Zechariah 13.1 Into which they now moved to plunge for cleansing. Yes, that precious fountain has to be opened to us, or experientially we discern it not. Like poor Hagar, ready to perish from thirst, knowing not that relief was near to hand, we convicted of our own fearful sins, groaning under the anguish of our lost condition, were ready to despair. But as God opened Hagar's eyes to see the well, or fountain, Genesis 21:19, so the Spirit of God now opens the understanding of the awakened soul to see Christ, his precious blood, his all-sufficient righteousness. But more, when the soul is brought to see the fountain or well, he discovers it is deep, and that he has nothing to draw with, John 4:11. And though he looks in it with a longing eye, he cannot reach into it so as to wash in it. He finds himself like the impotent man of John chapter 5, desirous of stepping in, but utterly without strength to do so. Then it is the Holy Spirit applies the atonement, sprinkling the conscience, Hebrews 10.23, effectively granting a realization of its cleansing efficacy. See Acts 15.8 and 9, 1 Corinthians 6.11. It is Christ's blood but the Spirit must apply it. And when the awakened and convicted sinner has been brought to Christ for cleansing and righteousness, 
Who is it that brings him to the Father to be justified by him? Who is it that bestows the freedom of access unto him from whom the sinner has been absent in the far country? Ephesians 2.18 tells us, quote, For through him, Christ the meditator, we both, regenerated Jews and Gentiles, Old Testament and New Testament sakes alike, have access by one spirit unto the Father, unquote. I, dear reader, it was nothing but the secret and invincible operation of the blessed spirit which caused you, a wandering prodigal, to seek out him whom before you dreaded as a consuming fire. Yes, it was none other than the third person of the Holy Trinity who drew you with the bands of love and taught you to call God as Father. Romans 8, 15. Chapter 8. The Spirit Working Faith. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans 15, 13. The principal bond of union between Christ and his people is the Holy Spirit. But as the union is mutual, something is necessary on our part to complete it, and this is faith. Hence, Christ is said to dwell in our hearts by faith. Ephesians 3:17. Yet let it be said emphatically, the spirit which unites to Christ and saves the soul is not merely a natural act of the mind ascending to the gospel as it ascends to any other truth upon reliable testimony, but it is a supernatural act, an effect produced by the power of the spirit of grace, and is such a persuasion of the truth concerning the Savior as calls forth exercises suited to its object. The soul being quickened and made alive spiritually begins to act spiritually. The soul is the life of the body. Faith is the life of the soul, and Christ is the life of faith. John Flavel The Implications of Saving Faith Saving faith is a cordial approbation of Christ an acceptance of him in his entire character as prophet, priest, and king. It is entered into covenant with him, receiving him as Lord and Savior. When this is understood, it will appear to be a fit instrument for completing our union with Christ, for this union is thus formed by mutual consent. Were people to perceive more clearly the implications and the precise character of saving faith, they would be the more readily convinced that it is the gift of God, in effect or fruit of the Spirit's operation on the heart. Saving faith is the coming to Christ, and the coming to Christ necessarily presumes a forsaking of all that stands opposed to him. It has been rightly said that true faith includes in it the renunciation of the flesh as well as the reception of the Savior. True faith admires the precepts of holiness as well as the glory of the Savior. J. H. Thornwell, 1850. Not until these facts are recognized, enlarged upon, and emphasized by present-day preachers is there any real likelihood of the effectual exposure of the utter inadequacy of that natural, quote, faith, unquote, which is all that thousands of empty professors possess. Saving faith is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. 2 Corinthians one twenty one. None but God, by his Spirit, can establish the soul in all his parts, the understanding, the conscience, the affections, and the will. The ground and reason why the Christian believes the Holy Scriptures is to be on, quote, the Spirit comforting, unquote. But a further word therein will not here be out of place. When the soul has been divinely awakened and convicted of sin, it is brought to realize and feel its utter depravity and vileness, its awful guilt and criminality, its utter unfitness to approach a holy God. 
It is emptied of self-righteousness and self-esteem and brought into the dust of self-abasement and self-condemnation. Dark indeed is the cloud which now hangs over it. Hope is completely abandoned and despair fills the heart. The painful conscience that divine goodness has been abused, divine law trotted underfoot, and divine patient trifled with, excludes the expectation of any mercy. In those in whom the Spirit works faith, he first blows down the building of human pretense, demolishes the walls which were built with the untempered mortar of man's own righteousness, and destroys the foundations which were laid in self-flattery and natural sufficiency, so that they were entirely shut up to Christ in God's free grace. Once awakened, instead of fondly imagining I am the man whom God will save, I am now convinced that I am the one who will be damned. So far from concluding I have any ability to even help save myself, I now know that I am without strength and no more able to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior than I can climb up to heaven. Evident it is, then, that a mighty supernatural power is needed if I am to come to him who justifieth the ungodly. None but the Almighty Spirit can lift a stricken soul out of the gulf of despair and enable him to believe to the saving of his soul. To God the Holy Spirit be the glory of his sovereign grace in working faith in the heart of the writer and of each Christian reader. You have attained peace and joy in believing, but have you thanked that peace giver, the Holy Spirit? Romans 15:13. All that joy unspeakable and full of glory, 1 Peter 1, 8, and that peace which passes all understanding, Philippians 4, 7, to whom is it ascribed? The Holy Spirit. It is particularly appropriate to him, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, 17, and 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. Then let us render unto him the praise which is his due.